So this is um, a laser pointer, and I've juiced this up. So if you do fall asleep, I will fuse your eyelids together. So just keep that in mind. So just a little background for the new, um, new our residents or for our intern. Basically, when we do these path lectures, I really want you to look at the section in the BCSC book and read it ahead of time. Now, this, this lecture is kind of hard because it's introduction, and so there's really not a whole lot to read in there. But next week, we're going to just go through the I a week at a time. So next week's going to be LID. And so read the section on LID because I really want you guys to know ahead of time what we're going to talk about. The format we use is we just go around the room and you describe what you see and tell us a little bit about what you know about the topic. Because you are a captive audience, you have to see my travel slides. Mm -hmm. And so you are stuck. And so wherever I've been, that's where you get to go. Okay. So since the ESCRS was in Copenhagen, you get to go to Copenhagen first. And so much like Amsterdam, it's famous for its canals. It's on the water. There's canals everywhere. And you see the ambiguous tourist boats. And so they cram, you know, 50 tourists in there. They're very low. Whoa. That's really weird. So they cram about 50 tourists at a time in there. And the reason that they're low is because the bridges have about five feet of clearance from the water to the bottom of the bridge. And so when you're going under the low bridges, you literally have to duck your head because they're very, very low. But this is a nice way to see the city. They pile you on tourist boats. And this is the famous street. They have the rainbow color of all the houses there. The people have their boats here. There's all kinds of restaurants and bars and things along here. So this is kind of the central part of what you think about when you think of Copenhagen. And here's a close-up of the other side. It goes right up to the end, and then it just ends here. And this is where you pick up all your tourist boats to go for a ride. And then this is the other side. Again, these, are, these I think, are apartments. I mean, people actually live here, which I don't know how fun that would be with, with tourists. But um, during that four days we were there, it was 72 degrees and sunny, which in Northern Europe is just unheard of. And so as a result, people take advantage of it. And so everybody, all the office workers, everybody were outside, and they were just, they put these little chairs out there, and they were just laying there you know, worshiping the sun because, you know, the sun, as opposed to Salt Lake where it's sunny 300 days of the year, it's sunny in Copenhagen about 30 days of the year. And so we happen to get four of them. So you can see this gorgeous blue sky. I mean, just unheard of. And so all along the water, these people are sitting there sunbathing. They're claws. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what they've got. And so, uh, you know, a chance to see some of the, the older buildings and the museum. This is the old Central Library. So this is the main central library, a lot of, lot of old buildings, a lot of old history, and we'll go into that as we go. So if we're going to talk about the eye, you really need to start with the embryology. And it's very important that you remember where the different parts of the eye came from, because that explains a little bit about some of the diseases that can occur. And so, you know, this is actually a mouse eye, which, which amazingly enough looks just like a human eye at about the same stage of gestation. And so really we all look alike when we're at this stage, and basically, you know, the optic vesicle starts as an outpouching from the neural tube. And so when you look at the neural tube, and it's sitting here, you'll start to get an outpouching from the neural tube coming out. And this occurs very early. You know, this is just a few weeks into gestation. And so looking at it in the mouse eye down below, this is from four weeks to five weeks, and then looking at it up above, very similar in humans and in mice. But basically, you get this outpouching from the neural tube. So this is now neuroectoderm. So you get this outpouching of neuroectoderm. It approaches the surface ectoderm, the surface of the skin, if you will, and then it will induce an infolding. So this neuroectoderm will infold, and then it will also infold a piece of this surface ectoderm, which eventually pinches off and forms the lens. So it's important when you look at what part of the eyes come from what, this neuroectoderm, as it invaginates, has got basically two layers. So it's like you took a balloon and you put your fist in it. It will make two layers. And these two layers are very important because these two layers give you what you think of as kind of the neuroectodermal tissue within the eye. And so the anterior part of these two layers forms the epithelium of the iris. The middle part here forms the epithelium, both layers of the ciliary body, and then the back forms the retina and the retina pigment epithelium. So they all come from those layers. 
Now, when you look at the retina layers, interestingly enough, the entire neural retina comes from that single inner layer. And so when you look at that little inner layer, the outer layer forms the RPE, the inner layer of that neuroectoderm forms all of the layers of the retina. When we get to the retina, you're going to know those layers. And so we have several themes in ocular pathology. One of the themes is layers. And so you'll often hear me talk about what do ogres, onions, and ocular pathology have in common? Layers. So lots of layers. Now, when you look at the eye as it's forming, interestingly enough, you need, you need blood, you need oxygen, you need nutrients to go into that eye. And so when the eye is forming, what will happen is there'll be a little fissure here, a little bit inferior nasally, and in this fissure runs the hyaloid artery. So the hyaloid artery comes into this fissure and it forms a plexus right behind the lens vesicle and actually gives that blood supply to the anterior segment of the eye as it's forming. And so you can look right here, here's the hyaloid artery, here's the choroidal fissure coming underneath and going in and forming that, that blood supply that goes in. Now, this explains why you can get some congenital anomalies. So, when that fissure closes, it'll start to close at the equator, and then it'll run forward and backward. If that fissure does not close properly, then you can get a coloboma. And what does coloboma mean? Ah, okay. What, what language does it come from? Greek. From the Greek, of course. So, from the Greek. So someone, someone's going to look that up and tell me next week what coloboma means. Well, actually, you guys all have your phones and shit here. Look it up. Tell me what coloboma means. Like incomplete closure of like an embryonal fissure. Does it mean like a, like a keyhole or something? Look it up. Look it up. Meaning defect. Coloboma, defect. From the Greek, meaning defect. From the Greek, exactly. So it just means a defect, basically. So if you look right here, when the anterior fissure doesn't close, you get a coloboma of the iris. And it's this little inferior area here, and you see the keyhole. And so you'll see a coloboma, you'll see that defect anteriorly. When you go posteriorly, inferiorly, now here's the optic nerve, and you can see this large coloboma, it's affecting um, you know, the development of the retina here, and you just see bare sclera, so it just looks white. Now this coloboma can sometimes involve the entire optic nerve, or it can in involve parts of the optic nerve. When we get to optic nerve, we'll talk about some of the effects of the coloboma. Now, the embryonic lens. Remember we said that that optic vesicle comes out, it touches the surface ectoderm. The surface ectoderm invaginates, eventually pinches off, and you get your early lens vesicle. Now, that's initially just a round ball of cells, and then eventually those posterior cells will move forward anteriorly and that's really important to remember because as the lens is developing there normally are not lens epithelial cells along the posterior capsule so that's abnormal so as the lens develops throughout life these little lens epithelial cells sit at the equator on both sides and eventually send fibers anteriorly and posteriorly so as the lens builds up you get progressive layers like a ball of yarn that you're putting more and more yarn around so the central fetal nucleus um, eventually it gets surrounded by an adult nucleus and then more adult tissue around it. So the center part of the lens gets compacted and the lens fibers continue to go throughout life. And so this is normally you do not have cells back here posteriorly. And so when you look at this, this is what it looks like. Anteriorly you do have these lens epithelial cells and they go right around to the equator and then they fan out along the edge of the lens, much like along the edge of like a flying saucer and those fibers go both anteriorly and posteriorly. So the part where, you know, where they, they meet eventually forms some little sutures. And so you get your Y sutures when you do that. So here it is again in a mouse embryo, in vagination, and then it forms the circle, and then those little cells come forward and fill that in. Again, exactly the same in a human. Now this is an actual human embryo. And so this is a human embryo, and you can see here is the lens. Here is the invaginated neuroectoderm. This will eventually be iris, epithelium, ciliary epithelium, retina, and RPE. 
Now, when you are feeding that anterior segment as it's going, that hyaluronic artery comes in and it has a plexus of vessels that, that are around the lens, the tunica vasculosa lentis, basically a tunic, you know, around the lens. So tunic, you think about it, remember those old Victorian England pictures where they had that thing around their necks, all these people had, okay, so that's a tunic. And so you get this little tunic of vessels <clears throat> around the lens as it's forming. And the key thing is that this should eventually regress. Now, anytime something can go wrong, sometime it will. And so eventually, if that hyaloid system in this tunica vasculosa lentis does not regress, then you can get diseases such as this. And so here you see, here's the stock. This is a, about a 25, 26 week embryo. By now, this should have regressed. You see, here's the hyaluronic artery coming out of the optic nerve, and there's that stock. And so you can sometimes get non-regression of this hyaloid system. Now, in the severe forms, you get a condition that we used to call PHPV, persistent primary, you know, vitreous. But now they call it what? Exactly. P V. No, P F V. Persistent fetal vasculature. So just put letters on everything that you have to memorize. So. And here's a close-up of what it looks like. So this is the lens seen in cross-section. And look at these little vessels here all over. So they form a little spider web of vessels behind the lens. And they feed that lens in the anterior segment as they're growing in the embryo. But they should regress. So again, when they don't regress, that's when you get disease. So we want to talk a little bit about some of the cells you want to look at. Because when we look at pathology, we look at a lot of cells. And this is obviously a fake cell. Nobody gets a blood smear with all these on there. And this comes, that tracked this all the way back to the early 60s. I don't know where this slide originally came from, but I copied it from David Apple, who copied it from somebody else. And so this is a fake slide from the mid 60s sometime. But the nice thing about it is this shows you all of the various um, blood types. And so what we're going to do, we're just going to go around the room. So. I guess, Terry, you're sitting in the hot seat. First off, what kind of cell is that right there? Uh, PMN. PMN, so polymorphal neutrophil. And you see it's got the multiple nuclei that are there. So some PMNs that are sitting here. Reese, what is that? Um. There's another one next to it there. Would that be a monocyte? What more specific? Look at the little granules in there. What color are they? Uh, are they kind of, this looks more basophilic to me, but I don't know, it's even for that slide. That's, yeah, well, that's more basophilic. These are more eosinophilic. This is an eosinophil. And the way you can tell an eosinophil is it's got kind of a heart-shaped bilobe nucleus. So you see this heart-shaped bilobe nucleus. You've got these little eosinophilic granules that are right there. Um, Chris, what is this then? That's the basophils. That's the basophils. I've never seen one of those on a blood smear. I don't know. They're, I think they've just made them up. I don't think they really exist. There is a basophil that, that is sitting right there. All right. What kind of cell is this? The interns are still liable. So. Is that a lymphocyte? It's a lymphocyte. So the way you can tell the lymphocyte is you can see that the nucleus takes up about 90% of the space of the cell and very, very thin area of cytoplasm around them. So, um, Lee, what is this? Platelets. Platelets, very good. Let's finish the round. What are these here? Easy ones. Red blood cells. Red blood cells, exactly. So that's what you see on a sphere, on a smear. All right, so let's talk a little bit about PMNs. I guess we'll come back since you did PMNs here, Tara. What do PMNs do? Okay, so they're involved in what? Um, inflammation and infection. Infection, so like bacterial infections, they're the cells you kind of think of that are the frontline troops when there's an infection there. Now, the way they fight infections is all of these granules have all kinds of bad humors in them that, that try to kill bacteria and fight infections. And so the problem is, is when these degranulate, you know, they can eat up bacteria and help to kill the infection, but they also kill the tissue around it. So if you've got a bunch of PMNs in your skin, that really doesn't matter. 
But if you have an infection in your cornea and all those PMNs come in there, uh, first of all, they can cause the cornea to melt because there's proteases in there, there's collagenases in there, there's all kinds of bad humors in there, and so they can cause real problems, which is why treating a bacterial corneal ulcer is truly an emergency because you really want to treat it before the body's own immune system kills that. So when you see the PMNs, you're thinking of an acute phase infection, you think of a bacterial type of infection. All right, what do we think of in eosinophils? Yeah, so kind of weird parasites and other kind of funny things in there. Now, also eosinophils can show up in what other common thing normally? Uh, short strouts? Well, even, no, common, like even just allergies. I mean, oh. you know, eosinophils can even show up in chronic allergies and things like that. But again, they've got all these eosinophilic granules that are sitting in here that they dump out in that nice bilobe heart-shaped nucleus. And so they could be more involved in, and you think about them in, in you know, infections with, with beasties that are in there. You know, you think of parasites and things like that, but they can also be part of a severe um, allergy, severe allergic reaction. And boy, that was supposed to be, this has been used so long, that was supposed to show some eosinophils, doesn't really show them very well. All right, so lymphocytes, what do lymphocytes do? Um, so they Well, they part. Some lymphocytes can differentiate in the plasma cells, not all. Okay. Um, what kind of infection or what kind of? I think viral see? infections. Can all right. So more viral infections. You think lymphocytes mm -hmm. and viral infections. Also, lymphocytes can be involved in inflammation. So they're kind of chronic, mononuclear inflammatory cells. So you think of chronic inflammation. You think of viri, things like that. And since you mentioned plasma cells, what are plasma cells? What do they do? Okay, so they're basically antibody factories. And they're just a type of lymphocyte. They're kind of the ultimate B lymphocyte, and they become an antibody factory. When you look at them, the nucleus now becomes eccentric, and you've got the cytoplasm here taking up about two thirds of it. Oftentimes, these nuclei will have this clumped chromatin. People call this the wagon wheel. So you look at like the wheels of a covered wagon with the spokes and the dots on them. So they get this wagon wheel clumping, and then right here, there's a whole bunch of Golgi apparatuses and they make all kinds of antibodies. So plasma cells become antibody factories. And the ultimate plasma cell is, is it gets so stuffed with antibody that eventually it pushes the nucleus out and you end up getting this bag of just antibodies. And so it becomes what's called a Russell body. So this is a sign of a really chronic um, inflammation. All right. I guess we'll go back, Ali. So eventually this can become a macrophage, but remember macrophages start as monocytes, and then as they leak out of the blood cell into the tissue, then they become macrophages. Or if you want to sound intelligent, you say macrophage. You say macrophage, and so that is intelligent. And, and if you measure something, you say, you say centimeters also, because it makes you sound intelligent. So, if you say something with a British accent, you sound really intelligent. Um, if you say it with an Alabama accent, you could be a Nobel Prize winner and you're still not going to sound intelligent. So. Sound like a winner. Exactly. Well, actually, I, you, you can sound your own kind. So if you say it with a Wyoming accent, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a Nobel Prize winner or not. It doesn't sound intelligent. So monocytes will eventually leak out into the tissue. They become macrophages. What kind of inflammation are macrophages associated with? So I like to think of macrophages as kind of the, the scavengers. And so, you know, when they come in, there's this kind of, you know, there's a battle going on. The bat body's trying to fight off this bacteria, and there's all kinds of, you know, dead horses laying around, people, and so the scavenger birds come in and scavenge it up. And that's what these monocytes do, these macrophages. And so they kind of help to eat up the, you know, the, the leftover from the battle that's happening when you're fighting an, an infection. And here's a more of a macrophage reaction that's coming in. So this is kind of a more chronic phase reaction. And kind of the, the ultimate macrophage, eventually they can become what are called epithelioid cells and they can even form giant cells. And so, Nico, in terms of giant cells, there are three different types of giant cells. 
that we need to know about. And of course, we wrote the first one down here. First one, you get a bonus, the Langhans type. What are the other two type of giant cells? What are uh, the Teuton? Teuton giant cells, okay. Uh, and then there's epithelioid. Is that, is that Actually, the third type is a foreign body foreign giant body. cell. So those are the three types of giant cells. So it's important. There's three types of giant cells. There's three types of granulomatous inflammation. So we want to keep those straight. So what we think of as a giant cell is the Langhans giant cell. And that's the one that's kind of shaped like a horseshoe. The nuclei line up around the side and the, the um, cytoplasm gets all jumbled up. And this is what you usually think of in a granulomatous inflammation is these Langhans type giant cells. And this is what they look like. Again, that horseshoe shape with the central nucleus. Now, they're often not by themselves. There's lymphocytes mixed in here. There's plasma cells mixed in here. There's other inflammatory cells. Now, here's the foreign body giant cell. The way you tell the difference between Langhans and foreign body giant cell, foreign body giant cell, the nuclei get jumbled up. So just as the name says, it's, it's a reaction against a foreign body. So in the eye, you will see these around sutures. You'll see these if a person got a stick in the orbit, you know, foreign body in the orbit. They usually don't form around metal. It's more of a vegetative material. So if you see them, you know, in the orbit, somebody gets a stick in there, gets poked with something, you'll often see these foreign body giant cells. And here is a suture. And it's kind of breaking down a little bit, an old nylon suture. And sure enough, there's these giant cells surrounding it. So they just kind of tend to surround and try to wall off this foreign material. And these are the coolest type of giant cells. This is the so-called Teuton giant cell. So extra bonus points, Nico. What disease do we see in the eye that are often associated with Teuton giant cells? Good board question. Young kid comes in with a spontaneous hyphema and something funny on their iris. So these are associated with juvenile xanthogranulomas. And what these cells have is they have the nuclei around, but they have this halo of lipid around them. So when we process tissue in the lab, it goes through steps where it gets dehydrated and then paraffin gets put in it so we can cut it and stain it. And as a result, the lipid gets dissolved. And so lipid in a normal processed um, slide will be white because the lipid will dissolve. So you get this halo of lipid around them. So these are Teuton giant cells. And the board question you want to remember is these can be associated with juvenile xanthogranulomas on the, on the iris. All right, so there's three types of Three types of giant cells are three types of granulomatous inflammation. So the first type we think of is called diffuse granulomatous inflammation. And the characteristic of, of that is, is sympathetic ophthalmia. So I guess we're back to Tara. What is sympathetic ophthalmia? Okay. So in the days before steroids, people would lose their eyes to this. And, you know, especially like World War I, you know, these poor guys are in the trenches and things are blowing up and one eye would get really severely damaged and then a couple weeks later the other eye would start to get inflammation they could go bilaterally blind. Fortunately, in the era of steroids, I mean, I think I've seen one case of sympathetic ophthalmia in the last 20 years and so you just don't see this anymore. But it is an autoimmune reaction. People will argue about What's, what it's the reaction to, but it's an autoimmune reaction. Do they have any idea that maybe that was what was causing the blind to say that? Would, like, could they go and say, hey, let's just cut out the eye from the nerve right from the get-go? Well, that's what we find is that if you have a severely damaged, traumatized eye, if you remove it within 10 to 14 days, you can prevent sympathetic ophthalmia from developing. So if you have an eye that's been severely traumatized, you know, somebody gets shot in the eye or they have a severe accident, and there's no way you're ever going to save that, you can remove it, but you have to do it within 10 to 14 days to prevent sympathetic ophthalmia because it's not an immediate reaction. So do we know when they've, they've figured that out? When they, you know, it seems like I think it's, it's just been people place. have observed enough cases and they yeah. saw when it, when it occurred, when it didn't. But we have found if you nucleate early, you can prevent it. But, you know, that's always a tough thing that, that you'll talk about when you talk with Boopy and those guys. 
so if a young person especially comes in with a severely traumatized diet, you don't just take it out right away. I mean, psychologically, people, that just devastates them. And, and so I always tell the residents, especially when you're on call, you do everything you can in the OR. You stay in there for three hours, you put that eye back together, you tell the person, you know, we did everything we possibly could to save that eye, but it's severely damaged. And then you go out and talk to the family. You make sure you leave some beads of sweat on your forehead. You know, okay, we tried for hours to put that eye together, but it's severely damaged. And then you give the patient a week or 10 days to get used to the fact that that eye is blind, it's not coming back, it hurts. Then you broach the issue of, of enucleation. Because if you do a primary nucleation, they really, it really devastates people. So you give them time to realize that the eye's not going to be saved, and then you take it out. But as long as you do it within 10 to 14 days, you will prevent sympathetic ophthalmia. So sympathetic ophthalmia, it's this diffuse granulomatous inflammation. It just affects the whole choroid. So like the OCAP questions they always ask is like different, so they say like sympathetic and BKH are the same. Like one of the like pathological differences is that so like sympathetic spares the corporeal capillary. Exactly. So VKH does not, and sympathetic does. And if you look very, real carefully, and they show you the path, the choreocapillaris is spared. All right. And you start to see, and you know, some some other kinds of of inflammation that you can see in these. And now this is a little bit different. This is now not a diffuse granulomatous inflammation, but this is a kind of a multifocal granulomatous inflammation. And what is this characteristic of? So, I guess, yeah. yeah, yeah chronic inflammation. Well, no, there's a specific type of granulomatous inflammation where you see multiple multifocal areas of inflammation. Um, I'm not sure. It's called sarcoidal. Oh. And so sarcoidal inflammation, you see multiple nodules of inflammation. And that's another type of granulomas. They call it sarcoidal. So when you look at sarcoid, you see these multiple lobules of inflammation, and you see these really bizarre giant cells, and it's really cool. They get these asteroid bodies in them, which are kind of cool. And I don't know, I guess that looks like an asteroid. I don't know. It looks kind of like a big spider to me, but they call these asteroid bodies. And so this is the second type of granulomatous inflammation. It is called sarcoidal. It's these nodular granulomatous, multifocal granulomatous inflammations. And then the third type is more of a focal or zonal type of granulomatous inflammation. And, and the ones that kind of characterize this is where you have a traumatic rupture of the lens capsule and you get this granulomatous inflammation around the ruptured lens capsule. And so the three types, the diffuse type, which is sympathetic ophthalmia, the nodular type, which is the sarcoidal, and then lastly, the focal type. And this is a patient, the horse kicked him in the head, cowboy from Wyoming. That, believe it or not, is the cornea. There's what's left of the iris. There's the remnant lens, ruptured lens capsule, raging inflammation around the ruptured lens capsule. All right, so there's no place else to put this, so I'm going to go ahead and just describe it a little bit here. So this is the beginning of an end-stage eye. So when an eye has a severe insult of any kind, infection, traumatic, um, chronic disease, eventually the eye begins to shut down. And so this happens to be an eye that had just chronic vitreous hemorrhage, it just shut down and you can see it's just full of blood, little cholesterol, you know, um, sparkles coming in there. And so eventually when an eye shuts down, Chris, what do we call the end stage of an eye that shut down? Uh, it's actually, but, but it's pronounced tysis, so it's called tysis bulbi, so tysical. But it's weird because it's P-H-T-H, so it's like but just tysis. And what language does that come from? Probably Latin. Exactly, it's the Latin, it's not the Greek. But, but remember, the Romans, they took everything. The Greeks invented it first, the Romans, they took from the Greeks. So even though it's Latin, the Greeks invented it first. But, so this is called tysis bulbi, and so when you look at an eye, it's an end-stage eye that's just shutting down. And so there's several characteristics when you look at it pathologically. So name one a characteristic that you would see when you look at a tysical eye pathologically. It's disorganized. Okay, so it's disorganized. You look at all of the intraocular contents completely disorganized. Name a second one. Um, it's just smaller or shrinking. Exactly. It shrinks. Third one.
Exactly. So it's hypotenuse. It's very soft. Fourth one. <laughs> Don't you hate when you get down to the fourth ones? Oh, I knew those. I knew those. I did. You can, get, you can get calcification, exactly. And what does eventually calcification lead to? Osteoporosis. Exactly. So you can get bone inside the eyes even. You get bone. Another thing when you're looking at this, look how thick the sclera is. So you get thick sclera. So the eye becomes hypotenuse. It gets really low pressure. Then it shrinks. And as the pressure is low, it's almost like there's nothing to push out against the sclera. So the sclera thickens as it becomes more edematous. The choroid is almost like a sponge, and so the choroid is like a sponge in water. It will even thicken and, and get more edematous. You get disruption of intraocular contents. And the shape, it's almost square rather than round as it, as it gets hypotenuse. And this is the thickened sclera, really thickened edematous sclera. And this is the choroid, very uh, like a sponge with water in it. So it becomes very spongy, very edematous because the eye's hypotenuse. And lastly, here is bone. So you literally get bony formation. Now, the cells that really lead to this are the RPE. So the retinal pigment epithelium is a pluripotential cell. If stimulated in the right way, it can form gliosis. It can form bone. I mean, it, it's really a pluripotential cell. And so if you look, this is bone. So my technician hates these when she cuts them because bone really chews up your blade when you're cutting it up. And so this is indeed bony formation that you can see in Tysus bulbi. Here's woven bone. Here's the disrupted RPE next to it. And so that's the end stage Tysus bulbi. All right, so I want to talk just a little bit about pathology because I want to get you guys while well, you're young before you spend a lot of time in the OR because I know the seniors never come to these lectures. They're always either off operating or out of the country or somewhere except right before the final low cap. So then they're going like, oh, gee, maybe I better start looking at this because I have to take O caps next month. So, you know, you guys, I want to get you when you're young. So the key is when you want a pathology analysis done of a specimen, communicate with me. Or when you're out in practice, communicate with a pathologist. Let them know ahead of time because there may be something special they want done. And it's better to just send an email or give a call ahead of time and say, hey, listen, I'm looking for this entity, what do I do? And so spend a lot of time communicating. Now, when you guys are in the OR working with Crandall and he's doing 14 cases, he's not gonna worry about pathology or filling out forms or anything, you guys are, so, so please do it. And that helps me a lot. Now, the key thing is, is the pathology requisition slip. And so when we get this requisition slip, it'll often say blind eye, lid lesion. That does nothing for me. So I don't know, are you worried about cancer? Are you worried about an infection? Do you want special stains? Do you want the tissue treated specially? So if you say, you know, superficial lid with ulceration, rule out squamous cell, all right, that gives me information and tells me how I need to treat that specimen. And so just two sentences on the form really help me to know what it is you're looking for. So, you know, fill out that requisition form and let us know. You know, drawings help a lot, and Boopy does these all the time. He'll put a little drawing on it and he'll say, okay, Nick, suspicious lesion, and he'll draw exactly where it is, and he'll uh, put on there where it is, okay, this is temporal, this is nasal, and then we can orient that in the lab and we know what to do with it. So that's very, very helpful. Now, there are some special things you want to do with tissue. When you're removing tissue, if you grab it really hard with the forceps, it causes crush artifact. So you want to be pretty gentle with that tissue. You don't want to crush it. If you're concerned about a tumor or something abnormal, you want to get normal edges around it so that we can, first of all, make sure that the lesion is removed completely, but secondly, that there's good normal tissue around it to compare it to. And put it in the fixation right away. Tell the nurse, okay, put it in fixation now. Don't let it sit around. Now, what do we normally use? 10% neutral buffered formalin is our standard solution, and that fixes the vast majority of them. Rarely, if you want to do, for example, electron microscopy, that's pretty uncommon unless you're looking for some weird 
storage disease or who knows. And so you have to have some glutaraldehyde mixed in there in order to get the tissue fixed for EM. Now, if you want lipid or you want fresh tissue, then we have to freeze that and cut it without fixating it. So if you want tissue that's fresh, again, you've got to call us right away because we're going to have to go pick it up immediately and freeze it so that we can cut it without processing it. So when you're looking at the fresh tissue, don't let it sit around because the tissue, if it's not preserved, will, will rot. And so what you want to do is, is you want to go ahead and you want to um, keep it cold if you can. So say you're practicing when you're done here. You're going to go out to Price, Utah and practice. You want to send me a specimen. You can put it in a container and put ice around the container, and it'll keep for 24 hours, then FedEx it to me. Now, the key thing is if you're going to get a tissue that you want fresh, you can't just put it in an empty jar. That'll, that'll you know, gum up the tissue. If you put a piece of wet tissue onto a 4x4, four four, the 4x4 four four will suck the moisture out of it, and that'll ruin it also. So what you want to do is put it on a moistened 4x4 four four or moistened gauze. Don't put it in a container full of saline. And we've seen that before. They say, oh, oh saline. Okay, so they you know, fill a thing with saline and plop it in there. That just macerates the tissue too. So you take a saline-soaked gauze or BSS or saline or whatever, moisten the gauze, put the specimen on there, close the container, and then if you call us, we'll come get it right away. If you're on the outside, you can put ice around it and it'll keep for 24 hours. But the key is saline-soaked gauze, not all the way in saline. Now, conjunctiva is its own different tissue. If you take off a piece of conj, it rolls up in a ball. And so if we want to look for pathology, if you're worried about a tumor and we get this rolled up ball, that doesn't do us any good. So what I tell you to do is take a little piece of cardboard. And what's ideal is, you know the little cardboard that you spin your gowns with? That's perfect. And so you cut about a two by two centimeter piece of that, take the non-shiny side, lay the specimen on it, and let it sit there for about a minute. And then just tell the technician to put it into formalin, the whole thing. And it'll stay stuck on there. And then when my um, technician in the lab takes it, she'll literally leave it on the cardboard while she fixes it. And then once the specimen is fixed, it'll come off like a little piece of, you know, pants that you put too much starch on that's really stiff. And then she can align it and cut it. And so that allows us to do that. Now, if you want to mark the margins, oh, yeah. It's the non-shiny side of the cardboard. No, the side. Oh, you want to definitely put the, the substantial propria down and the epithelium up. And so the other thing people say is, well, how do you know which is superior, which is inferior? How do you mark it? People put stitches in there, and you know sometimes that just gums up the tissue. Don't write on anything because ink will dissolve from our processing. So the ink will dissolve. And so what I find the best is to cut notches into the cardboard. And if you cut notches, that can do it, because sutures are okay, but if people have tried to pin it, they've tried to write on there, that just doesn't work. And so here's a little piece of cardboard, and we laid out the conge so it fixates on there, and then we said, okay, this notch is temporal. And then if you want to mark superior, maybe put two notches. And then on the form, you draw a picture or say it. You know, notches temporal, two notches are superior, and then we can align it when my tech cuts it. She'll put it on the slide, okay, superior is here, temporal is there, and then we cut all the way through the specimen and we can make sure if there is a tumor where the margins are and if you got them all or not. So that's conj. Lids, you don't necessarily have to do that because lid skin holds its shape better and you maybe put a little stitch in one edge or something like that. All right, one last little thing here and then we'll quit this one. This is just the intro. So I said we start real path next week. So this is the standard stain we use. And I can't remember. Reese, what's our most standard stain? What's the one we do 99% of the time? Uh, and eosin. Okay, so hematoxylin and eosin. So the hematoxylin stains the blue, eosin stains the pink or the red. And so that's our standard stain when you think of it. So here's a cornea. You can see that, that the eosinophilic stain stains the red, the hematoxylin stains the blue, and so this is our standard pathology stain. But there are several specialized stains that we do when, you, when we're looking for specific things. 
Uh, Chris, what do you think this stain is staining? Here's the hint. What, here's, what is this right here, first of all? Like epithelium. Epithelium. What is this little magenta line down here? Is that, is that a basement membrane? That's a basement membrane, okay. What stain stains for basement membrane? Basement membrane stain? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's called PAS. PAS. Periodic acid shift. That's why we call it PAS, because it's easier to say so. We occasionally will do a stay in looking for basement membrane, and that's called PAS. This is a really nice, nice uh, example here because here's the epithelium of the cornea. Here's the basement membrane right here. This layer right here is not staining. So, Chris, chance to save yourself. What is that layer right there? The stroma. More specific, part of the anterior stroma. Um, that stroma. So is that... That's Bowman's layer. And the reason I'm showing this is Bowman's layer is not a basement membrane, so it does not stain positive for PAS. Decimase membrane on the posterior part of the cornea is a basement membrane, so it does stain positive. So if you look right here, here's the basement membrane staining PAS positive. There's Bowman's not staining. All right, now, you will memorize eventually when we get to cornea the um, various corneal stromal dystrophies. And these are a good example of some special stains we use. And there's a special mnemonic we're going to do. But this is one of the corneal stromal dystrophies. And this is one of the stains that we use. And again, since we haven't covered this, you, you, you get a buy now just because you're an intern. But this is called Alshin Blue. And so this is Alshin Blue stain. And, and you can say, what does Alshin Blue stain stain? Anybody? Okay, so what's the mnemonic? Marilyn Monroe. Okay. Marilyn Manson. No, no, no. no it's not a singer. <laughs> really always gets her man in LA County. Exactly. So you're going to memorize that when we get to cornea. So that's a couple more lectures. But in any event, Marilyn, macular dystrophy, Monroe, mucopolysaccharide, really recessive, always Alshin Blue. So this is mucopolysaccharide on Alshin blue staining. And then gets granular, her, hyaline, man, Masson trichrome. Don't worry about it now. You'll, you'll learn it in cornea. So this is the Masson trichrome stain. And it's a three-type stain. And it, it stains the mucopolysaccharides red. It stains the stroma blue and then the epithelium more of a red. And then finally, the third one that Chris was trying to get to before, which is? The uh, uh, biofragments. Exactly. And what is that material, is it? Amyloid. Amyloid. And so L, lattice, A, amyloid, county or California, C, what's the stain? Congo red stain. I hear that whisper there. Congo red. And so it's not really red. It's kind of orange. But Congo red stain stains the amyloids. That's a stain you need to know about. And what's cool about it is if you cut the stain thick enough and you put cross-polarized filters on there, it lights up. So that's one of the most exciting things that you'll see in the iPath lab, which tells you how unexciting ocular pathology is. Yes? So in, in retina, you Amyloid streaks, are those true amyloids? No, those are angioid streaks, angioid different. Those are breaks in Brooks membrane, and so those are different, not amyloid streaks, angioid streaks, different things. So you can see amyloid in the cornea, you can rarely see it in the conjure in the skin, but cornea is where we see it in, in the dystrophies. Okay, there's some other stains we can do. What is this stuff? Oh, interns can get this. What is this stuff we're looking at? Yeah, look at these little beasties. What kind of, are, what are these? Those are fungi. So remember, bacteria are very tiny, little round clusters, little rods. These are big, 
um, you know, hyphae here, this is fungi. And so there is a special stain we use for fungi. It's a silver stain. It's called GMS, Gamori Methanamine Silver. So GMS stains for fungi, and it'll stain them silvery black. And so that's a fungus stain. Now there's even a specialized stain we use for these guys. This is a stain for amoebas. So you can, believe it or not, get acanth amoeba in the cornea. And so this is called a gridley stain, and this stains for acanth amoeba. So you can see it stains the stroma green, but these are these big cysts, acanth amoeba cysts. And so the gridley stain will stain for those. And we'll talk about these when we get to cornea, but I just wanted to show you there are various different stains we can do for various different situations. Now, this is an interesting stain. This is a stain where this is the cornea and there's all this blue right along the base of the epithelium. Anyone care to venture a guess here? It's an iron stain. And what's the iron stain called? Okay, it's Prussian blue. How do we remember that? Who were the Prussians? The Prussians were the militarists in, in what, the eastern part of Germany. They're the ones who really, uh, boy, I don't want to, again, be culturally insensitive. They're the ones who, like, basically started the, the basic part of, like, three different wars. But, okay, so Prussians, guns, tanks, iron. So Prussian blue stains for iron. So that's how you remember it. So Prussian blue stains for iron. And you get all kinds of little iron lines depositing in the cornea. And it's characterized by that iron in the epithelium. So anywhere you get a pooling of tears, you can get deposition of iron. So at the base of a keratoconus, the head of a pterygium, even where your eyelids sit, you can get a little tiny iron line in there. So Prussian iron, so Prussian blue iron stain. All right, this is an even more interesting stain. This, I'll give you guys a hint. This is a piece of fresh tissue. It was taken out fresh and then frozen. So what, what did I say we have to do fresh to see? Lipid. So this is a stain, it's really, I like it because it's very descriptive. So when you want to stain for lipid, you use the oil red O. So it's interesting, it stains oil, these little red O's. And so look, there's oil, and it forms these little red O's. So oil red O is the name of the stain, it stains for lipid, but you have to have fresh tissue because our processing will cause the, the lipid to dissolve away and then it'll just be empty. So if you want to do a lipid stain, you have to have fresh tissue. So lipid is stained, it makes these oil red O's. So it stains oil, these little red O's, oil red O. All right, so we'll say goodbye here. Here's one of the museums in Copenhagen. So next Tuesday morning, we're gonna do lid. So know all your lid lesions, your lid tumors and everything. And, and so I'm going to talk a lot less, and you guys are going to talk a lot more. Questions? All right, great, thanks. thanks.